one of the most powerful things that can happen when you spend a lot of time with her work is that it actually begins to condition how you see things in the world. I'm Kavir Moon, I teach art history at SciArp, and we are at Survey, a retrospective exhibition of works by Zoe Leonard. Leonard has talked about how when she first started to make photography, she was thinking about the idea of taking the perfect shot. Henri Cartier-Bresson's notion of the decisive moment. Even when she tried to, she wasn't able to make photographs like that. And then she realized that her photographs make sense because of the fact that they don't attempt to, or they, they can't encapsulate everything into one perfect image. There's a way in which she uses photography in terms of its language of fragmentation, contingency, and the way that it's able to construct different structures of relationality. The exhibition is not quite organized chronologically, but she has talked about how she organized the room spatially in terms of what artworks uh, made sense in connection with one another, almost sort of thematically or to kind of further realize certain ideas in one work and putting them in relationship to other works that happened either before or after. So in this first room, I see of it as a kind of introduction and a kind of overview, a survey, if you will, in which you you see a few examples of works from the 1980s and so from her early series of aerial points of view, largely of bodies of water or of clouds. And the titular piece, Survey. as well as a long row of suitcases, uh, which is titled 1961. It is the year in which she was born. It is a self-portrait in the sense that there are the same number of suitcases as the number of years that she's lived. In that way, it's a, an ongoing work. Every year, there's a new suitcase that's added, and it will keep sort of growing in that way over time. The photographs that she first took in the 1980s tended to be aerial points of view of cities, of rivers, of train tracks. And you start to really see a shift in terms of subject matter, as well as her approach to photography by the beginning of the 1990s. It's in large part because she started to become more aware of her position as a queer female artist who had a lot of friends, that a number of whom were gay, and were starting to be affected by the rise of the AIDS epidemic. And so she starts to become politically active in ACT UP, as well as co-founding queer feminist collectives such as Fierce Pussy, and starts to take photographs of things that were not quite as abstract, but felt perhaps more real to her, taking pictures of bodies, especially representations of bodies that you would find in science museums, such as anatomical models, devices that had been used on women's bodies to restrain them or to structure them into certain expectations of beauty from a more patriarchal point of view. So you start to see her think about the sort of gender nature of looking and the gendered nature of representation, particularly within the spaces of institutions. But then she's also questioning what it means to look and to look at objects that we deem to be valuable, historically significant, worthy of being called an art work. She often does not take photographs of live human beings. Most of her photographs are of trees or objects or spaces or scenes or photographs that other people have taken or that have been reproduced industrially. She very explicitly leaves a black frame so that you know that you're looking at an image that has been uncropped. Or uh, she finds found photographs and organizes them, classifies them, installs them in such a way that you think about the particular vantage point that the photograph is positioning you within.
behind me is a sculpture that's titled Tree from 1997. And to create this sculpture, what Leonard did was to find an object, a tree in this case, and to cut it up and then reassembled using bolts and metal plates. In this particular instance, you see these metal plates that come out from the architecture and it's propped up. And so there's a way in which the sculpture is as much about the original structure of the tree as it is about the architecture that enables it to now hold up, as it is about the idea of suturing each of these parts together to create this whole which is necessarily missing parts, kind of fragmented and um, becomes a kind of memory perhaps or a representation of what it once was when it was a living thing. In her works, you're always really aware of the object quality of photographs, the materiality, the way in which people sort of handle them, touch them, use them. She tries to not have them hide behind a frame and so when she installs them they're often simply displayed just behind a sheet of glass with L brackets. And then you start to see her use objects uh, that are assembled together often in the mode of accretion and you start to think about the image quality of sculptural objects, as well as the notion of indexicality, right, which is so central to photography. You see another shift in her work from around 1992 and then other works that she makes by the end of that decade. She spent some time in a remote area of Alaska where she wasn't intending to necessarily make artwork, but she found herself photographing again. She started to take photographs of the landscape, of trees as well as photographs of dead animals that she had either found in the landscape or animals that had been hunted in terms of subsistence hunting. When she moves back to New York, you see photographs that on the surface seem a bit ordinary, but she's paying attention to things that are evidence of neglect. You see these really moving photographs of trees that are growing around, these iron bars that were once meant to protect a young sapling, um, but that the tree has outgrown and that the city hadn't bothered to replace. Or you see trees seeming to spill over you know, concrete sidewalks. She is really paying attention to the city that's around her, including the sort of pockets of neglect, but then also resilience in terms of the life that is there. I think also there is a latent politics in terms of recognizing what is typically not looked at or not deemed valuable enough to look at or things that are marginalized. Behind me, there are a whole row of books that were published by Kodak. The title of the piece is the title of the book, which is How to Take Good Pictures. It's funny because Leonard's practice has been about contradicting the rules for how to take good photographs, finding different ways to make one think more about the process of taking a photograph, thinking almost in an ontological way, what is a photograph, as opposed to delivering a photographic image. Her mother passed away in 2008, and while cleaning up her house, she found a suitcase full of photographs taken from around World War II. What you see in the photographs are her grandmother and her mother as displaced people in Europe who make their way to the U.S. through the port of New York City. You really see the photograph as an object, so they have a shadow, the edges curl up. She often takes one or two photographs and crops them in different ways to really make you think about all the different possible vantage points that you can see these photographs, as well as using the distance between the camera and the photograph as a way to signify different levels of intimacy or different levels of closeness. Her body of family photographs have been re-photographed, also bring to mind the construction of an archive uh, that she had created in the 1990s. It was a commission by the uh, filmmaker Cheryl Denier for her film, uh, The Watermelon Woman. Denier and Leonard collaborated to create a whole series of photographs of a fictional African-American lesbian actress. Leonard tried to be as accurate as possible in terms of different technologies, 
things that would have been available at an earlier moment in the 20th century and then around the 1930s and to in different ways make this woman's story believable even though she was a fictional character. You see these photographs, but it makes you think about all the other photographs or all the other moments that have not been captured, that are unrepresentable. Even the photographs that were given are to some degree inscrutable or they're hard to read. A point that she makes in particular with a series of four photographs are photographs of her mother, and you know that because of the title. The series is titled Her Mother's First Name, which is Misha, but there's a glare on each of the photographs. You can't see the woman's face, but what does come into to view is the very sort of edge of an archival stamp. There are ways in which she makes you think about what is representable, what is not representable. There's different kinds of information that a photograph gives you depending on how you see it, your relationship to it, how you're positioned to it. But I think that also thinking about this social and political upheaval that her family had experienced, that it makes you think about history in terms of a negative space, right? In terms of the abyss that is sort of submerged and unrepresentable to a large degree.